Hey guys, David here, and today we're going to be talking about the recent announcement that Apple will be moving from having Intel processors in their Macs to custom designed Apple chips. Why should you care? What kind of impacts can we expect? And what are the benefits and risks of this kind of transition? Let's find out. Apple Silicon. Tech enthusiasts like me are excited by these words. Are they some kind of fruit-based implant? No. No, they're not. A few weeks ago, in June 2020, Apple hosted their annual Worldwide Developers Conference. This is the event where we find out about all of the new features and updates for iOS, iPadOS, macOS, and often more. This year had something a bit rarer though. Apple announced that having used Intel chips for their Mac computers since 2005, they were going to transition away from these to using their own Apple custom chips within the next two years. These custom Apple chips, or Apple Silicon, will be quite closely related to the kind of processors you find in recent iPhones and iPads, and very different from those that you find in current Macs and most Windows machines. So why are they doing this? Let's think about a few of the benefits, both for Apple and for you as a potential user of these devices. Without getting into minute technical detail, Intel have fallen quite far behind both their competitors and where they intended to be on making their chips smaller. Why is this important? Well, it's really important for efficiency, getting more power and performance from a processor while still having a manageable amount of heat that it is outputting. As a result of these problems, recent Intel processors have had slow and modest performance gains, but have been running hotter than a sauna filled with jalapenos. When Apple did some major redesigns, especially to their MacBooks in 2015-2016, it was on the assumption that Intel would be able to deliver smaller chips with high performance and manageable heat output. And that hasn't happened. Apple have looked more and more silly for their choices when they've redesigned these products in the last few years. And unlike me, I don't think Apple enjoy looking dumb. Contrast this with the performance of Apple's custom chips within the last few years. Hardly any power use because they've been optimized for iPhones and iPads, and yet performance, especially in the last couple of years, beating quite a large amount of notebook and desktop class processors from Intel. All of this with no notable heat output and no notable throttling or reduction in performance to manage that heat. Worked example, my 2020 iPad Pro, which I gave some impressions on recently, is pretty much as good with intensive creative work and demanding tasks as my 16 inch MacBook Pro. However, it barely even gets close to warm. As much as I love my MacBook, it gets noticeably warmer with these kind of tasks. And with heavy work, it can reach CPU temperatures internally of around 100 degrees. The rapper Nelly famously noted that it's getting hot in here, so take off all your clothes. However, on this one occasion, that advice is impractical, Nelly. And as I think we can probably agree, hot temperatures and melting, that's not a good vibe. Just ask that dude from Robocop or the Wicked Witch of the West. Apple Silicon right now is a little bit like Will Smith breaking into movies around the turn of the 20th century. Except rather than charm, charisma, and 90s rap skills, Apple is bringing power efficiency, performance, and great generation over generation improvements in their design. The track record might not be long, but you can see the star potential. And sadly, Intel is the Jazzy Jeff, which needs to be left behind. The high performance alongside low power use for Apple Silicon also means potential benefits to both portability and battery life of devices. You can either make devices slimmer, lighter, and sleeker, or you can pack the same form factor with even more battery. Or perhaps more likely, Apple calibrates their engineering efforts to find a sweet spot between those two. Apple Silicon also brings potential benefits to features and price of future devices. Because they have such a similar architecture to those that are used in iPads and iPhones, there's already a huge amount of benefits and knowledge exchange that can be done. 
This means over time, so long as Apple is efficient in the way that they engineer, research and develop things, and they've done pretty good so far, you would expect Apple Silicon to be less expensive than remaining with Intel. This could theoretically lead to price reductions while Apple keeps similar profit margins, so reducing costs for the end user, or I suspect more likely prices remaining the same, maybe we get more features for the same price. Another exciting feature of Apple Silicon is that it allows the Macs that will have it in the future to run iOS and iPadOS apps. There's several million apps that will suddenly instantaneously be available for the Mac. Not every app in the App Store will make sense on a Mac form factor, but things like Procreate or LumaFusion becoming available for Mac computers is, as Ron Burgundy would say, a pretty big deal around here. Now this is a big change and not without risks. Intel chips use an architecture for their processors called x86, and that has been the standard across Macs and Windows machines for decades. Coding for them is really well understood. By contrast, Apple Silicon will use a different architecture known as ARM or ARM. And while it's been pretty well understood for iOS and for iPads, iPhones, using more traditional apps on there is pretty young in its development. So one risk as a result is around initial compatibility. Big apps and Apple's own apps will certainly be updated to run smooth and well from day one. However, smaller apps may not have the ability to prioritize this and therefore the time it takes for apps to become compatible could be longer and some apps might not even end up with compatible versions. Apple's solution to this is a software called Rosetta 2. This basically translates code that works in the x86, the Intel way of doing things, into the ARM architecture, the Apple Silicon way of doing things. And it was shown in Apple's demonstration to be very robust, running things like Maya for heavy 3D work and Shadow of the Tomb Raider for gaming, which is another performance strenuous task. But if apps do have to run through this Rosetta translation layer, it will be very much like having a conversation with translation happening in the middle. It will still work, but it won't be as smooth or as efficient as if things were happening all in the same native language. So what does all of this mean for you? For general consumers and light computer users, I doubt you'll see anything except benefits from this. The types of software that you use for general productivity, office work, web surfing, content consumption, those will be day one priorities which Apple will have running buttery smooth. And therefore, I think this will just bring nicer, sleeker designs, lighter devices, better battery life. It's, a, it's pretty much a win for this group. The other major group is power users or pro users. The kind of people who've got major workflows involving video, art, music, 3D rendering, motion graphics, data science, things that are asking a lot of the computers that they use. If you're mainly using Apple's Pro apps, things like Xcode, Final Cut, Logic Pro, then you're probably in a position to be confident very soon after this transition happens. But if that isn't you, or you rely on some softwares which aren't being controlled directly by Apple, then I would recommend waiting for a year or two after this happens and assessing how your workflow is impacted by these changes. One other friction is the loss of Boot Camp. This was a feature on the Intel Macs which allowed you to install Windows as well as Mac OS on your machine and to have the best of both worlds. Because Windows on ARM architecture is a bit like Rihanna's acting career, we might have to wait a while before it's possible to natively install Windows on Mac machines again after this transition. Overall, the more that your workflow or your income relies on some of these things that I just mentioned, the more cautious I would be. Imagine you are the two guys from Home Alone approaching a staircase which is eerily quiet. So, overall conclusions. I think it's very likely that this transition to Apple Silicon is going to bring better performance and potentially a whole bunch of other benefits. There are some risks, especially if you rely on more niche software or features, but overall I think there's great cause for optimism about all of this. 
there might also be some interesting wider bonus impacts. Given how powerful recent iPads have been and the fact that Mac apps will now be getting coded for very similar processes, perhaps there's a chance that we get more pro apps like Final Cut and Logic on the iPad. I, I for one would really like that. Another potential bonus. With a huge universe of highly capable and competitively priced iOS apps suddenly becoming available on Mac, could we see some consumer-friendly price disruption as existing software sellers on the Mac are forced to reassess the value proposition they're giving to users? Anyway, for now, that's all. I'm going to be watching with interest when the first Apple Silicon machines ship at the end of 2020. I hope you found the video enjoyable and interesting. If you liked what you saw, please like and subscribe to support the channel. Until next time, thanks for watching and take it easy.